this this project is um, grew out of my initial project, which looked at women or judges, women judges in Africa, um, a book that we co-edited that came out this year. And I started thinking about what happens at the international level, what are some of the interesting things that are happening at the domestic level that could be happening at the international level as well. So that gave birth to the second book that we're working on, co-editing by um, a former judge of the International Criminal Court, myself and a colleague at Brandeis University, and hopefully that will come out sometime next year. So there's still a lot of things going on in my mind I'm thinking about, so this presentation might sound like a thousand and one projects in one, and um, just bear with me um, on, on that. So I started off trying to look at, I was kind of, I think what got my interest was the ICC and the role of women judges in the ICC uh, based on some of the issues that the court had been dealing with, the questions of its focus on Africa, the questions or the accusations against the office of the prosecutor for not dealing with gender related issues, even though now they are making an effort to do that. And so I looked at the composition of the ICC, the bench, and I thought, hmm, the ICC is the most, uh, as of now, the court that has the highest number of women on it, um, close to 50% when the court came into force in 2003. So it's really been heralded as the one or the court where we should learn from. And this is important because if you look at prior to the ICC, we had, we had the International Court of Justice, which is under the United Nations system, a court that existed for close to 50 years, and during that period had only one woman judge. And then later on, two trickled in, one from Uganda and the other one from China, of all places. So once again, the case of women on the ICJ kind of confirmed what feminist legal theorists had been talking about, the fact that international law is very high, um, patriarchal. And so we see that even in the composition of the court that deals with these issues at the international level. So for gender, um, gender activists, for civil society organizations, for gender scholars, it was really interesting when the ICC gave birth to more women on the bench. Now, you look at the ICC composition and you find out, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, that the highest number, the ICC and International Criminal Court, I hope I said that, uh, I went to the ICC and um, the Hague and I said, I'm looking for the ICC, and someone said, what, the cricket? <laughs> <laughs> so I reminded myself I have to spell out what ICC says, means before. Um, and I'll, look, I'll talk about that in a bit. If you look at the composition of the ICC, it's broken down into different regions of the world. And so we have the Western European and other group, the Eastern European, the Latin American, and then the Africa group. The Africa group has the highest number of women on the court. So that is something that I'll be talking about. So the question <coughs> is, when we're talking about gender and judging, why is it important? Why should we talk about women on the bench? Why should we talk about women as judges on international courts? And this is, this is important for a lot of reasons. A gender balance court, in terms of the composition of the judges that sit on these courts, it's important for a number of reasons, very quickly, that women represent or make up more than half of the world's population. In most of these cases that we're talking about under international criminal law, women may, to a large extent, be those who are disproportionately affected by the human rights abuses that would go to these courts. Not always the case. And so it's important that this institution that represents the world, that represents human rights issues, should have a, a, a fair representation. It should mirror what society looks like. Now this is a, a, a point that is also drawn from the literature on courts at a domestic level, that if we have women making up more than half of a domestic scene, then it makes sense that we should have women's representation. Now that falls down to questions of, well, do we just put any woman there? No, they have to be qualified, right? They must have been put on the court based on the merit they show. Now that discussion is also subject to a lot of um, uh, debate because the question is who determines what is merit and who gets onto the court. So it's important for representation. It's also important, some would argue, for legitimacy. Legitimacy in the sense that it is a court that represents the needs of people that kind of deals with international issues, it should be legitimate, at least normatively, in the eyes of those who perceive it to deal with their issues. Now, once again, legitimacy is another issue because the whole idea of our international courts legitimate is another discussion. But some would argue for purposes of symbolic representation, for purposes of normative legitimacy, it makes sense. And of course, the issue of equity, which I think is important. 
equity, equality principles. And that is what the UN Charter talks about, equality of states, and I think that should also go into equality of the genders. So women's entry into judiciaries have been contested uh, within the domestic level, as we looked at. Um, in the United States, and largely um, Europe, mostly Great Britain, I would say, because continental Europe, if you look at the civil, um, civil law tradition, different outcomes. But then again, even though they have higher number of women judges, it's at a lower level. So that's contested as well. Women's entry into judiciaries have not been easy. In the United States, it was legally, there were laws that were created in some places that prevented women from going to law school in the first place. And that had to be broken. And then there were provisions that prevented women from working in law firms. And then, of course, there's still that contestation going on. How do women progress within law firms, within legal professions, and, of course, into judiciaries? Um, the case has been different in the context of Africa. Different countries, once again, whether it's civil law or common law, in the case of South Africa, South Africa, and then some parts of Southern Africa, the other issue of the hybrid system that they have, the, the civil common law mix and all that, it, it leads to different outcomes. So we haven't had legal restrictions into women entering into judiciaries at the domestic level in most African countries. Uh, South Africa can kind of put that in a different category. But it's also been an issue of the level, the availability of education opportunities for women. And as we saw these education opportunities open, it provided more avenue for women to go into judiciaries. In other cases, it was also because the judiciary wasn't really a prestigious job. People would go to law school, become lawyers for lots of reasons, maybe make money, maybe because of the prestige. The judiciary wasn't really such a prestigious institution until things got better. And also, we look at issues that may have happened during the era of military regimes, whereby it was a dangerous thing to be a judge. And so those could have weeded out. So at the domestic level, different factors. At the international level, it's very interesting. As I talked about the ICJ and uh, the International Court of Justice, um, you find out that it becomes a what, judicialization of politics politicization of, of the judiciary, that it involves a lot of politics, more than we think, that the judiciary should be independent and that judges should be placed on these benches based on merit. But you find out that there's a lot of trading that happens behind before the nominations start. And even when the nominations start, when they're having the elections, there's a lot of bargaining going on. So what the ICC or the Rome Statute sought to do was to make sure that they will minimize that level of bargaining that happened but we find out that it may not totally have been needed out. Now, um, I'll talk about this. So the question now, moving on, is what, what do women bring to court? Why should we be advocating for more women, apart from the issue of the fact that courts should be representative, that they tend to lend some amount of legitimacy to the institution, the fact that it's a principle of international law, equality should be espoused. Uh, I'll look at some of the issues that women bring to the courts, even though, once again, some scholars would argue we shouldn't look at the difference women bring, because if we look at it, then we're defeating the whole purpose of advocating for women. But I think it's important, apart from gender diversity, apart from the fact that they, that they, they diversify the courts, I think they bring more to these courts um, than we traditionally think. And why African women? Just because I am one. <laughs> 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 and also because nobody has been studying it. So I woke up one day, I had a, a wonderful aha moment. I'm like, oh wow, nobody's done this, seriously, really? And so I'm still waiting for someone to tell me, oh, sorry, you're late. Someone did it already. Um, but I haven't found that yet. So if you know of it, let me know. Because what I've seen so far, based on the first book I did, no one had done it. And I thought, really? Am I a genius? Maybe not. I'm still waiting. Somebody's going to come up with a book and say, sorry, that had been done before you came on the scene. So, so the question is, what if? What if, this is a, a picture of the International Court of Justice in the Hague, and what if all the judges, 15, 17 judges on this panel, were all Chinese women? That's fine. They're all Chinese women, 15 judges. It's OK. They are there as independent, as impartial, and unbiased. They can do the job. They can do it just well, can't they? I will leave that thought for you to decide. 
But that has been the issue. When we look at the international system, international relations, international justice prior to the coming of the ICC, that it's been dominated most often by white male. And then as we're talking about, there's been a trickling in. And the first woman to be on the court was from Great Britain. And then, of course, we've had the Ugandan and, and um, Chinese judge, female judge, join the court. So we have to think about these things, that there may be many questions that we have to ask if a court is composed of mainly people who fit certain characteristics. We might argue, well, they can do the job. They are applying the international principles of law, and therefore they can advocate for international law. But then there are other issues that come into play that do have an impact on how they perceive the law, and how they interpret it, and how they write those judgments. So once again, imagine a court where it's all made up of women. That would be great, right? Maybe yes, but not so much. And so we also have to be mindful that there must be a fair balance to large extent. And so as I talked about, when the Rome Statute was created, and the ICC came into force, Article 36 of the Rome Statute made specific provision. Looking back at what happens with the ICJ and other tribunals prior to the ICC, providing that in appointing judges to the court, they must look at the, make sure that the bench is representative of the legal, major legal traditions of the world. They must also ensure <coughs> that the, the people who are being placed on the bench have um, uh, experience in the area of the law, and that they must also ensure that the judges, there is a fair representation of male and female judges, right? So that is what has been the pushing force for ensuring that there are women, that there must be a fair representation of male and female. And they add on to that who have expertise in issues concerning violence against women and children. Now, this is very important. We'll see how that may have played into the ICC. So we are very happy. The ICC is great. We are all using the role statute and telling uh, regional courts and domestic courts, like, do what the ICC has done. But maybe not so fast. Right. Even though the ICC had a high number of women, 50% the first time it came, the number has been turned around. They're still making progress. But as of 2015, when they elected new judges, so the question is that even though progress has been made, that progress can be eroded if we don't keep on pushing and advocating. And we'll see that, um, how that would happen. Now, at the regional level, this is a picture of the judges of the African Court on Human Rights case in Tanzania. And you find out that, um, as at this time, of the 11 judges, two were women. And so when I, I'll show you a map in a few minutes, you find out that the number has changed, I'm happy to say, with the election they had this year, they nominated two more women onto that court. And so that could be progress being made for lots of different, different reasons. Now, this is a picture of the ECOWAS court. And as at present, um, ECOWAS, Economic Community of West African States, um, based in Abuja, um, there's only one woman on the court. However, if you look at the totality of the number of judges who have served on that court, women have made, um, have been, you know, there's been a, a good representation of women um, on that court. But as of now, if we're talking about it, the numbers have gone lower, so we need to do something about that. So very quickly, you ask yourself, who, who, who are these women? Um, normally when I'm teaching my students, this is quiz time. Who can identify who? But uh, I'm going to go on for the sake of time. Um, <laughs> the African Court on Human Rights judge, Supreme, former Supreme Court judge from Ghana, who served on the court, the first set of women to be appointed. And um, she rose to be the president of the court, vice president and later president of the court. This is a Ugandan judge who is currently on the International Court of Justice. This is a judge from Botswana who is also currently serving on the ICC. And this is a judge from Ghana who served on the court and she's retired now. And she served one of the longest terms, 12 years, even though the court provides that you serve for only nine years. Ask yourself how that happened. Most of these courts, once they're established, they have a staggered system whereby you can be re-elected. And she was um, re-elected and reappointed. So very quickly, um, putting my five minutes left, this is just a map of a study that was done by the United Nations showing the number of women in judiciaries around the world. And you can see the numbers. If you look at it globally, women are still less than 30%. And the 30% is the threshold that has been used in the study of gender or women in judge, um, uh, judiciaries. Whether we hit the 30, when we hit the 30 mark, 30% mark, then we can say that some progress is being made. 
but that has not been achieved, even though this is dated, I must say, to 2011 um, study. Very quickly, coming back to what I'm talking about, geographic, um, uh, not geographic, uh, representation. You see that the ICC has the highest number, right? So at the beginning of the court, 50%. Now this is changing. The ICTY tribunal for you, you um, Yugoslavia has the highest number. But I'm hoping you've seen an interesting trend when we talk about that. Now, ECOWAS, as I talked about, also has hit a 40% threshold if you look at the totality of women who have served on the court. And it goes on the African court is over here. The one that has done the worst is the International um, Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Once again, very much a representation of the patriarchal nature of international law. But what's happening? If you take ICTY and look at that next to it, ad litem, you have number of women high, second to the ICC. If you take out the ad litem and go to permanent, where does it fall? So what's happening? We see that when there are ad litem judges on the court, more of them may tend to be women. And so what's the gender, gender dynamic going on here? And they'll fall the same with the ICTR. It drops, but not as much. And my hypothesis right now, once again, is because of the preponderance on the ICTR at that time of African women judges. So we look at the numbers here very quickly. Um, I looked at the year the court was established, the number of judges who have served on the court since it was established, the number that are women, and then breaking down the percentages. Now, as you can see, I'm updating it, uh, try to update it as it changes. The African court, as I mentioned, has elected two more women, so that's going to change. And then, of course, the ICC, the 15, is a total number, and five African women. So if you look at the breakdown, this is what happens of the ICC. The African group, number of states, the highest number of women come from the Africa group. Mm. Interestingly, if you look at the Western Europe and other group, they call it Western Europe and other group, it's had the highest number of judges on the court. The highest number of judges on the ICC have been from Europe, Western Europe, but it's had the lowest number of women, only one. So what's going on there? What is the African case telling us about women being represented on these courts? Very interesting questions we need to look at. So um, what, what, what are the trends that I'm observing and waking up at night and thinking, oh, this might be a trend, and then put it down and go back to sleep? That it might change, and I'm looking forward to some of the discussions because I have these crazy discussions with myself, like, <laughs> you know, I feel like a mad one sometimes. <laughs> and so I, I would like to solicit your help on that. That indeed, if you're looking at the trend, the politics of selection, as we talked, as I talked about, very important. And what you find is that most of the literature will tell you the reason why we may not have more women is because of the old boys club and international law. And so it's all about this kind of invisible pack on the back, um, the shoulder. When the positions become available, uh, women within the networks whereby these positions are told and who is going to nominate. But in the case of the African context, whether at the ICC, at ECOWAS, and maybe a little is improving at the African court, we find out that women may not necessarily belong to these networks that may have the access to the politics, because it is politics. Who gets nominated? Your name has to come. The position comes open. They communicate the mission in the country, and then it sends it to the foreign affairs, and then it goes on to the attorney general AG and all that. If women are not in those networks, your name will not be put forward. But we're seeing some progress being made in the content. Now, I also find out that in the case of Africa, at the ICC, and even at the African court, all the regions <coughs> of the, um, the continent have had a woman represented. So in the case of the ICC, East Africa, Kenya is represented, um, uh, Ghana is represented, or West Africa is represented by Ghana, and so on, except North Africa. So once again, that's an interesting story, which there are many reasons why um, you can look at. These women are also trailblazers, and if you look at their profiles, they've done a lot, they've achieved a lot, they've been a first woman this, first woman that, first woman that. So you find out that they come as trailblazers. They don't just sit on the court. If you look at the ICC, the African court, these women, the African women that I have looked at, have been first vice president of the court, and they've, we've had three women who have been elected. And this is an election that's done by the judges amongst themselves. So it does tell something about their leadership. Finally, the ICC has a woman who is the president of the court. She's from Argentina. Her term is coming to an end. So once again, it speaks. But the same has been said of the 
African Court on Human Rights and the ECOWAS Court. There have been activists, once again, as I mentioned, the ICC makes provision that they must have that um, um, qualification or background. And of course, they've also very importantly contributed to international law. Um, one being Judge Navi Pillay from South Africa, who is highly commended for her work in the Akayesu case, even though I'll say that that is also contested because it's a question of who does it, not just one person, the court as a rule that does it. So these women are contributing in a lot of ways, very important also, challenging gender hierarchies within the domestic context and at the international level. Right, they are challenging these gender hierarchies that have existed. They also do um, socialize their male counterparts, and not just their male counterparts in terms of gender diversity, but also cultural diversity. Right, the explanations they bring and help their male counterparts or other judges um, helps to enrich the courts and the laws that they, they they come up with. So to, to ask them to, to conclude, I didn't know I was going to talk that much. Um, <laughs> I thought 20 minutes is a lot of time. Um, the third observation is to look at how institutional design can have an impact on gender parity. The ICC Rome Statute, 30% of the world, makes innovation focus on women being appointed gender. But the African court, the protocol that established the court, also has the same provision. But why do we see the different outcomes? Why is it that the ICC has that provision and African women are on the top? The African Court on Human Rights has the same provision, but the women have not done so well. So these are some of the mad questions I ask myself. Um, will their um, appointments at the international level or regional level have an impact on women's entry into the judiciaries at the domestic level? Um, how can we maintain the gains that have been made in terms of women's entry um, into international courts? And will this trickle down at the international level, and um, I also am trying to propose it or propound a theory. So those of you who are theorists, help me out uh, on how we can come up with a theory that explains the African, uh, the, the women's presence in judiciaries in Africa at a domestic level and also at the international level. So thank you very much.